Then Feanor grew wrathful, for he still feared delay, and hotly he spoke to Olwe. You renounce your friendship even in the hour of our need, he said. Yet you were glad indeed to receive our aid when you came at last to these shores, faint-hearted loiterers and well-nigh empty-handed. In huts on the beaches would you be dwelling still, had not the Noldor carved out your haven and toiled upon your walls. But Alwe answered, We renounce no friendship, but it may be the part of a friend to rebuke a friend's folly. And when the Noldor welcomed us and gave us aid, otherwise then you spoke. In the land of Amman we were to dwell for ever as brothers whose houses stand side by side. But as for our white ships, those you gave us not. We learned not that craft from the Noldor, but from the lords of the sea, and the white timbers we wrought with our own hands, and the white sails were woven by our wives and our daughters. Therefore, we will neither give them nor sell them for any league or friendship. For I say to you, Feanor, son of Finwë, these are to us as are the gems of the Noldor, the work of our hearts, whose like we shall not make again. Thereupon, Feanor left him and sat in dark thought beyond the walls of Alqualonde until his host was assembled. When he judged that his strength was enough, he went to the haven of the swans, and began to man the ships that were anchored there, and to take them away by force. But the Teleri withstood him, and cast many of the Noldor into the sea. Then swords were drawn, and a bitter fight was fought upon the ships, and about the lamplit quays and piers of the haven, and even upon the great arch of its gate. Thrice the people of Feanor were driven back, and many were slain upon either side. But the vanguard of the Noldor was succoured by Fingon, with the foremost of the host of Fingolfin, who coming up found a battle joined, and their own kin falling, and rushed in before they knew rightly the cause of the quarrel. Some thought indeed that the Teleri had sought to waylay the march of the Noldor at the bidding of the Valar. Thus at last... The Teleri were overcome, and a great part of their mariners that dwelt in Alqualonde were wickedly slain. For the Noldor were become fierce and desperate, and the Teleri had less strength, and were armed for the most part but with slender bows. Then the Noldor drew away their white ships, and manned their oars as best they might, and rowed them north along the coast. And Olwe called upon Osse, but he came not for it was not permitted by the Valar that the flight of the Noldor should be hindered by force. But Uyanan wept for the mariners of the Teleri, and the sea rose in wrath against the slayers, so that many of the ships were wrecked and those in them drowned. Of the kinslaying at Alqualonde, more is told in that lament which is named Noldalanta, the fall of the Noldor, that Maglor made ere he was lost. Nonetheless, the greater part of the Noldor escaped, and when the storm was past, they held on their course, some by ship and some by land. But the way was long, and ever more evil as they went forward. After they had marched for a great while in the unmeasured night, they came at length to the northern confines of the guarded realm, upon the borders of the empty waste of Araman, which were mountainous and cold. There they beheld suddenly a dark figure standing high upon a rock that looked down upon the shore. Some say that it was Mandos himself, and no lesser herald of Manwe. And they heard a loud voice, solemn and terrible, that bade them stand and give ear. Then all halted and stood still, and from end to end of the host of the Noldor the voice was heard speaking the curse and prophecy which is called the prophecy of the North, and the doom of the Noldor. Much it foretold in dark words, which the Noldor understood not, until the woes indeed after befell them. But all heard the curse that was uttered upon those that would not stay, nor seek the doom and pardon of the Valar. 
Tears unnumbered ye shall shed, and the Valar will fence Valinor against you, and shut you out, so that not even the echo of your lamentation shall pass over the mountains. On the house of Feanor the wrath of the Valar lieth from the west unto the uttermost east, and upon all that will follow them it shall be laid also. Their oath shall drive them, and yet betray them, and ever snatch away the very treasures that they have sworn to pursue. To evil end shall all things turn that they begin well, and by treason of kin unto kin, and the fear of treason shall this come to pass. The dispossessed shall they be for ever. Ye have spilled the blood of your kindred unrighteously, and have stained the land of Ammon. For blood ye shall render blood, and beyond Ammon ye shall dwell in death's shadow, for though Eru appointed to you to die not in Ea, and no sickness may assail you, yet slain ye may be, and slain ye shall be, by weapon and by torment and by grief, and your houseless spirits shall come then to Mandos. There long shall ye abide, and yearn for your bodies, and find little pity, though all whom you have slain should entreat for you. And those that endure in Middle-earth, and come not to Mandos, shall grow weary of the world as with a great burden, and shall wane, and become as shadows of regret before the younger race that cometh after. The Valar have spoken. Then many quailed, but Feanor hardened his heart and said, We have sworn, and not lightly, this oath we will keep. We are threatened with many evils, and treason not least, but one thing is not said, that we shall suffer from cowardice, from cravens, or the fear of cravens. Therefore I say that we will go on. And this doom, I add, the deeds that we shall do shall be the matter of song until the last days of Arda. But in that hour Finarfin forsook the march, and turned back, being filled with grief and with bitterness against the house of Feanor, because of his kinship with Alwe of Alqualonde. And many of his people went with him, retracing their steps in sorrow, until they beheld once more the far beam of the Mindon upon Tunar, still shining in the night, and so came at last to Valinor. There they received the pardon of the Valar, and Finarfin was set to rule the remnant of the Noldor in the blessed realm. But his sons were not with him, for they would not forsake the sons of Fingolfin, and all Fingolfin's folk went forward still, feeling the constraint of their kinship and the will of Feanor, and fearing to face the doom of the Valar, since not all of them had been guiltless of the kinslaying at Alqualonde. Moreover, Fingon and Torgon were bold and fiery of heart, and loath to abandon any task to which they had put their hands until the bitter end, if bitter it must be. So the main host held on, and swiftly the evil that was foretold began its work. The Noldor came at last far into the north of Arda, and they saw the first teeth of the ice that floated in the sea, and knew that they were drawing nigh to the Helcaraxa. For between the land of Ammon, that in the north curved eastward, and the east shores of Endor, which is Middle-earth, that bore westward, there was a narrow strait, through which the chill waters of the encircling sea and the waves of Belagea flowed together, and there were vast fogs and mists of deathly cold, and the sea streams were filled with clashing hills of ice, and the grinding of ice deep sunken. Such was the Helcaraxa, and there none yet had dared to tread, save the Valar only, and Ungoliant. Therefore Feanor halted, and the Noldor debated what course they should now take. But they began to suffer anguish from the cold and the clinging mists through which no gleam of star could pierce, and many repented of the road and began to murmur, especially those that followed Fingolfin, 
cursing Feanor and naming him as the cause of all the woes of the Eldar. But Feanor, knowing all that was said, took counsel with his sons, and two courses only they saw to escape from Araman and come into Endor, by the straits or by ship. But the Helcaraxa they deemed impassable, whereas the ships were too few. Many had been lost upon their long journey, and there remained now not enough to bear across all the great host together. Yet none were willing to abide upon the western coast, while others were ferried first. Already the fear of treachery was awake among the Noldor. Therefore it came into the hearts of Fëanor and his sons to seize all the ships and depart suddenly, for they had retained the mastery of the fleet since the Battle of the Haven, and it was manned only by those who had fought there and were bound to Fëanor. And as though it came at his call, there sprang up a wind from the northwest, and Feanor slipped away secretly with all whom he deemed true to him, and went aboard and put to sea, and left Fingolfin in Araman. And since the sea was there narrow, steering east and somewhat south, he passed over without loss. And first of all the Noldor set foot once more upon the shores of Middle-earth, and the landing of Feanor was at the mouth of the firth which was called Drengist, and ran into Dor Lomin. But when they were landed, Mithros, the eldest of his sons, and on a time the friend of Fingon, ere Morgoth's lies came between, spoke to Feanor, saying, Now what ships and rowers will you spare to return, and whom shall they bear hither first? Hingon the Valiant? Then Feanor laughed as one fay, and he cried, None and none. What I have left behind I count now no loss, needless baggage on the road it has proved. Let those that cursed my name curse me still, and whine their way back to the cages of the Valar. Let the ships burn. Then Maithros alone stood aside. But Feanor caused fire to be set to the white ships of the Teleri. So in that place which was called Lascar, at the outlet of the firth of Drengist, ended the fairest vessels that ever sailed the sea, in a great burning, bright and terrible. And Fingolfin and his people saw the light afar off, red beneath the clouds, and they knew that they were betrayed. This was the first fruits of the kinslaying and the doom of the Noldor. Then Fingolfin, seeing that Feanor had left him to perish in Araman or return in shame to Valinor, was filled with bitterness. But he desired now as never before to come by some way to Middle-earth and meet Feanor again. And he and his host wandered long in misery, but their valour and endurance grew with hardship, for they were a mighty people, the elder children undying of Eru Iluvata, but new come from the blessed realm, and not yet weary with the weariness of earth. The fire of their hearts was young, and led by Fingolfin and his sons, and by Finrod and Galadriel, they dared to pass into the bitterest north and finding no other way, they endured at last the terror of the Helcaraxa on the cruel hills of ice. Few of the deeds of the Noldor thereafter surpassed that desperate crossing in hardihood or woe. There Elenwe, the wife of Torgon, was lost, and many others perished also. And it was with a lessened host that Fingolfin set foot at last upon the outer lands. Small love for Feanor or his sons had those that marched at last behind him, and blew their trumpets in Middle-earth at the first rising of the moon. Of the Sindar Now, as has been told, the power of Elwë and Melian increased in Middle-earth, and all the elves of Beleriand, from the mariners of Curden, to the wandering hunters of the Blue Mountains beyond the River Gelion, owned Elwë as their lord. 
Elu Thingal, he was called, King Greymantle in the tongue of his people. They are called the Sindar, the Grey Elves of Starlit Beleriand. And although they were Mori Quendi under the lordship of Thingol and the teaching of Melian, they became the fairest and the most wise and skilful of all the elves of Middle-earth. And at the end of the first age of the training of Melkor, when all the earth had peace and the glory of Valinor was at its noon, there came into the world Luthien, the only child of Thingol and Melian. Though Middle-earth lay for the most part in the sleep of Yavanna, in Beleriand, under the power of Melian, there was life and joy, and the bright stars shone as silver fires. And there in the forest of Neldoreth, Luthien was born, and the white flowers of Nipchredil came forth to greet her as stars from the earth. It came to pass during the second age of the captivity of Melkor that dwarves came over the blue mountains of Ered Luin into Beleriand. Themselves they named Khazad, but the Sindar called them Naugrim, the stunted people, and Gonhirim, masters of stone. Far to the east were the most ancient dwellings of the Naugrim, but they had delved for themselves great halls and mansions after the manner of their kind in the eastern side of Ered Luin. And those cities were named in their own tongue, Gabil Gathol and Tumunzahar. To the north of the great height of Mount Dolmed was Gabil Gathol, which the elves interpreted in their tongue Belegost, that is, Miklaberg. And southward was delved Tumunzahar by the elves named Nogrod, the Hollow Bold. Greatest of all the mansions of the dwarves was Khazad Dum, the Dwaro Delf, Hathodrond in the elvish tongue, that was afterwards in the days of its darkness called Moria. But it was far off in the mountains of mist, beyond the wide leagues of Eriador, and to the Eldar came but as a name and a rumour from the words of the dwarves of the Blue Mountains. From Nogrod and Belagost, the Naugrim came forth into Beleriand, and the elves were filled with amazement, for they had believed themselves to be the only living things in Middle-earth that spoke with words or wrought with hands, and that all others were but birds and beasts. But they could understand no word of the tongue of the Naugrim, which to their ears was cumbrous and unlovely, and few ever of the Eldar have achieved the mastery of it. But the dwarves were swift to learn, and indeed were more willing to learn the elven tongue than to teach their own to those of alien race. Few of the Eldar went ever to Nogrod and Belegost, save Eol of Nan Elmoth and Maeglin his son. But the dwarves trafficked into Beleriand, and they made a great road that passed under the shoulders of Mount Dolmed and followed the course of the river Askar, crossing Gelion at San Athrad, the ford of stones, where battle after befell. Ever cool was the friendship between the Naugrim and the Eldar, though much profit they had one of the other, but at that time those griefs that lay between them had not yet come to pass, and King Thingol welcomed them. But the Naugrim gave their friendship more readily to the Noldor in after days, than to any others of elves and men, because of their love and reverence for Aula, and the gems of the Noldor they praised above all other wealth. In the darkness of Arda already the dwarves wrought great works, for even from the first days of their fathers they had marvellous skill with metals and with stone. But in that ancient time iron and copper they loved to work, rather than silver or gold. Now Melian had much foresight after the manner of the Maya, and when the second age of the captivity of Melkor had passed, she counselled Thingol that the peace of Arda would not last for ever. He took thought, therefore, how he should make for himself a kingly dwelling and a place that should be strong if evil were to awake again in Middle-earth, and he sought aid and counsel of the dwarves of Belegost. They gave it willingly, for they were unwearied in those days and eager for new works. And though the dwarves 
ever demanded a price for all that they did, whether with delight or with toil, at this time they held themselves paid. For Melian taught them much that they were eager to learn, and Thingol rewarded them with many fair pearls. These Cirden gave to him, for they were got in great number in the shallow waters about the Isle of Bala. But the Naugrim had not before seen their like, and they held them dear. One there was, as great as a dove's egg, and its sheen was a starlight in the foam of the sea. Nymph Helos, it was named, and the chieftain of the dwarves of Belegost prized it above a mountain of wealth. Therefore the Naugrim laboured long and gladly for Thingol, and devised for him mansions after the fashion of their people, delved deep in the earth. Where the Esgalduin flowed down and parted Neldoreth from Region, there rose in the midst of the forest a rocky hill, and the river ran at its feet. There they made the gates of the hall of Thingol, and they built a bridge of stone over the river by which alone the gates could be entered. Beyond the gates wide passages ran down to high halls and chambers far below that were hewn in the living stone, so many and so great that the dwelling was named Menigroth, the Thousand Caves. But the elves also had part in that labour, and elves and dwarves together, each with their own skill, there wrought out the visions of Melian, images of the wonder and beauty of Valinor beyond the sea. The pillars of Menegroth were hewn in the likeness of the beeches of Orima, stock, bough, and leaf, and they were lit with lanterns of gold. The nightingales sang there as in the gardens of Lorien, and there were fountains of silver and basins of marble and floors of many-coloured stones. Carven figures of beasts and birds there ran upon the walls, or climbed upon the pillars, or peered among the branches entwined with many flowers. And as the years passed, Melian and her maidens filled the halls with woven hangings, wherein could be read the deeds of the Valar, and many things that had befallen in Arda since its beginning, and shadows of things that were yet to be. That was the fairest dwelling of any king that has ever been east of the sea. And when the building of Menegroth was achieved, and there was peace in the realm of Thingol and Melian, the Naugrim yet came ever and anon over the mountains, and went in traffic about the lands. But they went seldom to the Phalas, for they hated the sound of the sea, and feared to look upon it. To Beleriand there came no other rumour or tidings of the world without. But as the third age of the captivity of Melkor drew on, the dwarves became troubled, and they spoke to King Thingol, saying that the Valar had not rooted out utterly the evils of the north, and now the remnant, having long multiplied in the dark, were coming forth once more and roaming far and wide. There are fell beasts, they said, in the land east of the mountains, and your ancient kindred that dwell there are flying from the plains to the hills. And ere long the evil creatures came even to Beleriand, over passes in the mountains or up from the south through the dark forests. Wolves there were, or creatures that walked in wolf shapes, and other fell beings of shadow, and among them were the orcs, who afterwards wrought ruin in Beleriand. But they were yet few and wary, and did but smell out the ways of the land, awaiting the return of their lord. Whence they came, or what they were, the elves knew not then, thinking them perhaps to be Avari, who had become evil and savage in the wild, in which they guessed all too near, it is said. Therefore Thingol took thought for arms, which before his people had not needed, and these at first the Naugrim smithed for him, for they were greatly skilled in such work, though none among them surpassed the craftsmen of Nogrod, of whom Telkar the smith was greatest in renown. A warlike race of old were all the Naugrim, and they would fight fiercely against whomsoever aggrieved them. Servants of Melkar, or Eldar, 
or avari, or wild beasts, or not seldom their own kin, dwarves of other mansions and lordships. Their smithcraft, indeed, the Sindar soon learned of them. Yet in the tempering of steel alone of all crafts, the dwarves were never outmatched, even by the Noldor. And in the making of mail of linked rings, which was first contrived by the smiths of Belegost, their work had no rival. At this time, therefore, the Sindar were well armed, and they drove off all creatures of evil and had peace again. But Thingol's armories were stored with axes and with spears and swords and tall helms and long coats of bright mail. For the hauberks of the dwarves were so fashioned that they rusted not, but shone ever as if they were new burnished. And that proved well for Thingol in the time that was to come. Now, as has been told, one Lenwe of the host of Olwe forsook the march of the Eldar at that time when the Teleri were halted by the shores of the great river upon the borders of the westlands of Middle-earth. Little is known of the wanderings of the Nandor, whom he led away down Anduin. Some, it is said, dwelt age-long in the woods of the Vale of the Great River. Some came at last to its mouths, and there dwelt by the sea, and yet others, passing by Ered Nimrais, the White Mountains, came north again and entered the wilderness of Eriador between Ered Luin and the far mountains of Mist. Now these were a woodland people, and had no weapons of steel, and the coming of the fell beasts of the north filled them with great fear, as the Naugrim declared to King Thingol in Menegroth. Therefore Denethor, the son of Lenwe, hearing rumour of the might of Thingol and his majesty, and of the peace of his realm, gathered such host of his scattered people as he could, and led them over the mountains into Beleriand. There they were welcomed by Thingol, as kin long lost that returned, and they dwelt in Ossirian, the land of seven rivers. Of the long years of peace that followed after the coming of Denethor, there is little tale. In those days, it is said, Daeron, the minstrel, chief lawmaster of the kingdom of Thingol, devised his runes, and the Naugrim that came to Thingol learned them and were well pleased with the device, esteeming Daeron's skill higher than did the Sindar, his own people. By the Naugrim, the Kirth were taken east over the mountains, and passed into the knowledge of many peoples. But they were little used by the Sindar for the keeping of records until the days of the war, and much that was held in memory perished in the ruins of Doriath. But of bliss and glad life there is little to be said before it ends. As works fair and wonderful, while still they endure for eyes to see, are their own record, and only when they are in peril or broken for ever do they pass into song. In Beleriand in those days the elves walked, and the rivers flowed, and the stars shone, and the night flowers gave forth their scents. And the beauty of Melian was as the noon, and the beauty of Luthien was as the dawn in spring. In Beleriand, King Thingol upon his throne was as the lords of the Maya, whose power is at rest, whose joy is as an air that they breathe in all their days, whose thought flows in a tide untroubled from the heights to the deeps. In Beleriand, still at times rode Oreme the Great, passing like a wind over the mountains, and the sound of his horn came down the leagues of the starlight, and the elves feared him for the splendour of his countenance and the great noise of the onrush of Naha. But when the Valaroma echoed in the hills, they knew well that all evil things were fled far away. But it came to pass at last that the end of bliss was at hand, and the noontide of Valinor was drawing to its twilight. For as has been told, and as is known to all, being written in lore and sung in many songs, Melkor slew the trees of the Valar with the aid of Ungoliant, and escaped, and came back to Middle-earth. Far to the north befell the strife of Morgoth and Ungoliant. 
but the great cry of Morgoth echoed through Beleriand, and all its people shrank with fear. For though they knew not what it foreboded, they heard then the herald of death. Soon afterwards Ungoliant fled from the north and came into the realm of King Thengol, and the terror of darkness was about her. But by the power of Melian she was stayed, and entered not into Neldoreth, but abode long time under the shadow of the precipices in which Dorthonian fell southward. And they became known as Ered Gorgoroth, the mountains of terror, and none dared to go thither, or pass nigh them. There life and light were strangled, and there all waters were poisoned. But Morgoth, as has before been told, returned to Angband and built it anew. And above its doors he reared the reeking towers of Thangorodrim, and the gates of Morgoth were but one hundred and fifty leagues distant from the bridge of Menegroth. Far, and yet all too near. Now the orcs that multiplied in the darkness of the earth grew strong and fell, and their dark lord filled them with a lust of ruin and death. And they issued from Angban's gates under the clouds that Morgoth sent forth, and passed silently into the highlands of the north. Thence on a sudden a great army came into Beleriand, and assailed King Thingol. Now in his wide realm many elves wandered free in the wild, or dwelt at peace in small kindreds far sundered, and only about Menigroth in the midst of the land, and along the Phalas in the country of the Mariners, were their numerous peoples. But the orcs came down upon either side of Menegroth, and from camps in the east between Kelon and Gelion, and west in the plains between Sirion and Narog, they plundered far and wide. And Thingol was cut off from Círdan at Eglarest. Therefore he called upon Denethor, and the elves came in force from Region beyond Aros, and from Osirion, and fought the first battle in the wars of Beleriand. And the eastern host of the orcs was taken between the armies of the Eldar north of the Andram, and midway between Aros and Gelion, and there they were utterly defeated. And those that fled north from the great slaughter were waylaid by the axes of the Naugrim that issued from Mount Dolmed. Few indeed returned to Angband. But the victory of the elves was dear bought. For those of Assyrian were light-armed and no match for the orcs, who were shod with iron and iron-shielded, and bore great spears with broad blades, and Denethor was cut off and surrounded upon the hill of Ammon Ereb. There he fell, and all his nearest kin about him, before the host of Thingol could come to his aid. Bitterly, though his fall was avenged, when Thingol came upon the rear of the orcs and slew them in heaps, his people lamented him ever after, and took no king again. After the battle some returned to Osirian, and their tidings filled the remnant of their people with great fear, so that thereafter they came never forth in open war, but kept themselves by wariness and secrecy. And they were called the Lyquendi, the Green Elves, because of their raiment of the colour of leaves. But many went north and entered the guarded realm of Thingol, and were merged with his people. And when Thingol came again to Menegroth, he learned that the orc host in the west was victorious, and had driven Círdan to the rim of the sea. Therefore he withdrew all his people that his summons could reach within the fastness of Neldoreth and Region. And Melian put forth her power, and fenced all that dominion round about with an unseen wall of shadow and bewilderment, the girdle of Melian, that none thereafter could pass against her will, or the will of King Thingol, unless one should come with a power greater than that of Melian the Maya. And this inner land, which was long named Eglador, was after called Doriath, the guarded kingdom, land of the girdle. Within it there was yet a watchful peace, but without there was peril and great fear, and the servants of Morgoth roamed at will, save in the walled havens of the Phalas. 
but new tidings were at hand, which none in Middle-earth had foreseen, neither Morgoth in his pits, nor Melian in Menegroth. For no news came out of Ammon, whether by messenger, or by spirit, or by vision in dream, after the death of the trees. In this same time, Feanor came over the sea in the white ships of the Teleri, and landed in the firth of Drengist, and there burned the ships at Losgar. Of the sun and moon, and the hiding of Valinor. It is told that after the flight of Melkor, the Valar sat long unmoved upon their thrones in the Ring of Doom. But they were not idle, as Feanor declared in the folly of his heart. For the Valar may work many things with thought rather than with hands, and without voices, in silence, they may hold counsel one with another. Thus they held vigil in the night of Valinor, and their thought passed back beyond Ea, and forth to the end. Yet neither wisdom nor power assuaged their grief, and the knowing of evil in the hour of its being. And they mourned not more for the death of the trees than for the marring of Feanor. Of the works of Melkor, one of the most evil. For Feanor was made the mightiest in all parts of body and mind, in valour, in endurance, in beauty, in understanding, in skill, in strength, and in subtlety alike, of all the children of Iluvata, and a bright flame was in him. The works of wonder for the glory of Arda that he might otherwise have wrought, only Manwe might in some measure conceive. And it was told by the Vanya who held vigil with the Valar, that when the messengers declared to Manwe the answers of Feanor to his heralds, Manwe wept and bowed his head. But at that last word of Feanor, that at the least the Noldor should do deeds to live in song for ever, he raised his head as one that hears a voice far off, and he said, So shall it be. Dear bought those songs shall be accounted, and yet shall be well bought, for the price could be no other. Thus even as Eru spoke to us, shall beauty not before conceived be brought into Ea and evil yet be good to have been. But Mandos said, And yet remain evil. To me shall Feanor come soon. But when at last the Valar learned that the Noldor had indeed passed out of Ammon and were come back into Middle-earth, they arose and began to set forth in deeds those counsels which they had taken in thought for the redress of the evils of Melkor. Then Manwe bade Yavanna and Nienna to put forth all their powers of growth and healing, and they put forth all their powers upon the trees. But the tears of Nienna availed not to heal their mortal wounds, and for a long while Yavanna sang alone in the shadows. Yet even as hope failed and her song faltered, till Perion bore at last upon a leafless bough one great flower of silver, and Laurelin a single fruit of gold. These Yavanna took, and then the trees died, and their lifeless stems stand yet in Valinor, a memorial of vanished joy. But the flower and the fruit Yavanna gave to Aula, and Manwe hallowed them, and Aula and his people made vessels to hold them and preserve their radiance as is said in the Narsilian, the Song of the Sun and Moon. These vessels the Valar gave to Varda, that they might become lamps of heaven, outshining the ancient stars, being nearer to Arda. And she gave them power to traverse the lower regions of Ilmen, and set them to voyage upon appointed courses above the girdle of the earth, from the west unto the east, and to return. These things the Valar did, recalling in their twilight the darkness of the lands of Arda, and they resolved now to illumine Middle-earth, and with light to hinder the deeds of Melkor. For they remembered the Avari that remained by the waters of their awakening, and they did not utterly forsake the Noldor in exile, and Manwe knew also 
that the hour of the coming of men was drawn nigh. And it is said indeed that even as the Valar made war upon Melkor for the sake of the Quendi, so now for that time they forbore for the sake of the Hildor, the aftercomers, the younger children of Iluvata. For so grievous had been the hurts of Middle-earth in the war upon Utumno, that the Valar feared lest even worse should now befall. Whereas the Hildor should be mortal and weaker than the Quendi to withstand fear and tumult. Moreover, it was not revealed to Manwe where the beginning of men should be, north, south, or east. Therefore the Valar sent forth light, but made strong the land of their dwelling. Isil the Sheen, the Vanya of old, named the moon, flower of Telperion in Valinor. And Anna the fire golden, fruit of Laurelin, they named the sun. But the Noldor named them also Rana, the wayward, and Vaza, the heart of fire that awakens and consumes. For the sun was set as a sign for the awakening of men and the waning of the elves, but the moon cherishes their memory. The maiden whom the Valar chose from among the Maya to guide the vessel of the sun was named Arian, and he that steered the island of the moon was Tilion. In the days of the trees, Arian had tended the golden flowers in the gardens of Varna and watered them with the bright dews of Laurelin. But Tilion was a hunter of the company of Orime, and he had a silver bow. He was a lover of silver, and when he would rest, he forsook the woods of Arima, and going into Lorien, he lay in dream by the pools of Este in Telperion's flickering beams, and he begged to be given the task of tending for ever the last flower of silver. Arion the maiden was mightier than he, and she was chosen because she had not feared the heats of Laurelin, and was unhurt by them, being from the beginning a spirit of fire whom Melkor had not deceived nor drawn to his service. Too bright were the eyes of Arian for even the Eldar to look on, and leaving Valinor she forsook the form and raiment which, like the Valar, she had worn there, and she was as a naked flame, terrible in the fullness of her splendour. Isil was first wrought and made ready, and first rose into the realm of the stars, and was the elder of the new lights, as was Telperion of the trees. Then for a while the world had moonlight, and many things stirred and woke that had waited long in the sleep of Yavanna. The servants of Morgoth were filled with amazement, but the elves of the outer lands looked up in delight, and even as the moon rose above the darkness in the west, Fingolfin let blow his silver trumpets and began his march into Middle-earth, and the shadows of his host went long and black before them. Tilion had traversed the heaven seven times, and thus was in the furthest east when the vessel of Arion was made ready. Then Anna arose in glory, and the first dawn of the sun was like a great fire upon the towers of the Pelori. The clouds of Middle-earth were kindled, and there was heard the sound of many waterfalls. Then indeed Morgoth was dismayed, and he descended into the uttermost depths of Angband, and withdrew his servants, sending forth great reek and dark cloud to hide his land from the light of the day-star. Now Varda purposed that the two vessels should journey into Ilmen, and ever be aloft, but not together. Each should pass from Valinor into the east and return, the one issuing from the west as the other turned from the east. Thus the first of the new days were reckoned after the manner of the trees, from the mingling of the lights when Arian and Tilion passed in their courses, above the middle of the earth. But Tilion was wayward and uncertain in speed, and held not to his appointed path and he sought to come near to Arion, being drawn by her splendour, though the flame of Anna scorched him, and the island of the moon was darkened. Because of the waywardness of Tilion, therefore, and yet more because of the prayers of Lorian and Este, who said that sleep and rest had been banished from the earth, and the stars were hidden, Varda changed her counsel, 
and allowed a time wherein the world should still have shadow and half-light. Anna rested there for a while in Valinor, lying upon the cool bosom of the outer sea, and evening, the time of the descent and resting of the sun, was the hour of greatest light and joy in Amman. But soon the sun was drawn down by the servants of Ulmo, and went then in haste under the earth, and so came unseen to the east, and there mounted the heaven again, lest night be overlong an evil walk under the moon. But by Anna the waters of the outer sea were made hot and glowed with coloured fire, and Valinor had light for a while after the passing of Arian. Yet as she journeyed under the earth and drew towards the east, the glow faded, and Valinor was dim, and the Valar mourned then most for the death of Laurelin. At dawn the shadows of the mountains of defence lay heavy on the blessed realm. Varda commanded the moon to journey in like manner, and passing under earth to arise in the east, but only after the sun had descended from heaven. But Tilian went with uncertain pace, as yet he goes, and was still drawn towards Arian, as he shall ever be so that often both may be seen above the earth together, or at times it will chance that he comes so nigh that his shadow cuts off her brightness, and there is a darkness amid the day. Therefore, by the coming and going of Anna, the Valar reckoned the days thereafter until the change of the world. For Tilion tarried seldom in Valinor, but more often would pass swiftly over the western land, over Avathar, or Araman, or Valinor, and plunge in the chasm beyond the outer sea, pursuing his way alone amid the grots and caverns at the roots of Arda. There he would often wander long, and late he would return. Still, therefore, after the long night, the light of Valinor was greater and fairer than upon Middle-earth, for the sun rested there, and the lights of heaven drew nearer to earth in that region. But neither the sun nor the moon can recall the light that was of old, that came from the trees before they were touched by the poison of Ungoliant. That light lives now in the Silmarils alone. But Morgoth hated the new lights, and was for a while confounded by this unlooked-for stroke of the Valar. Then he assailed Tilion, sending spirits of shadow against him, and there was strife in Ilmen beneath the paths of the stars. But Tilion was victorious, and Arian Morgoth feared with a great fear, but dared not come nigh her, having indeed no longer the power. For as he grew in malice and sent forth from himself the evil that he conceived in lies and creatures of wickedness, his might passed into them and was dispersed, and he himself became ever more bound to the earth, unwilling to issue from his dark strongholds. With shadows he hid himself and his servants from Arian, the glance of whose eyes they could not long endure, and the lands near his dwelling were shrouded in fumes and great clouds. But seeing the assault upon Tilian, the valour were in doubt, fearing what the malice and cunning of Morgoth might yet contrive against them. Being unwilling to make war upon him in Middle-earth, they remembered none the less the ruin of Almeren, and they resolved that the like should not befall Valinor. Therefore at that time they fortified their land anew, and they raised up the mountain walls of the Pelori to sheer and dreadful heights, east, north, and south. Their outer sides were dark and smooth, without foothold or ledge, and they fell in great precipices with faces hard as glass, and rose up to towers with crowns of white ice. A sleepless watch was set upon them, and no pass led through them, save only at the Kalakiria. But that pass the Valar did not close, because of the Eldar that were faithful and in the city of Tyrion upon the green hill, Finarfin yet ruled the remnants of the Noldor in the deep cleft of the mountains. For all those of elven race, even the Vanya and Ingwe, their lord, must breathe at times the outer air, 
and the wind that comes over the sea from the lands of their birth. And the Valar would not sunder the Teleri wholly from their kin. But in the Kalakiria they set strong towers and many sentinels, and at its issue upon the plains of Valmar a host was encamped, so that neither bird nor beast nor elf nor man nor any creature beside that dwelt in Middle-earth could pass that leaguer. And in that time also, which songs call Nurtale Valenoreva, the hiding of Valinor, the enchanted isles, was set, and all the seas about them were filled with shadows and bewilderment. And these isles were strung as a net in the shadowy seas from the north to the south, before Tol Eresia, the lonely isle, is reached by one sailing west. Hardly might any vessel pass between them, for in the dangerous sounds the waves sighed for ever upon dark rocks shrouded in mist. And in the twilight a great weariness came upon mariners and a loathing of the sea. But all that ever set foot upon the islands were there entrapped and slept until the change of the world. Thus it was that as Mandos foretold to them in Araman, the blessed realm was shut against the Noldor. And of the many messengers that in after days sailed into the west, none came ever to Valinor, save one only, the mightiest mariner of song. Of Men the Valar sat now behind their mountains at peace, and having given light to Middle-earth, they left it for long untended, and the lordship of Morgoth was uncontested save by the Valar of the Noldor. Most in mind Ulmo kept the exiles, who gathered news of the earth through all the waters. From this time forth were reckoned the years of the sun, Swifter and briefer are they than the long years of the trees in Valinor. In that time the air of Middle-earth became heavy with the breath of growth and mortality, and the changing and aging of all things was hastened exceedingly. Life teemed upon the soil and in the waters in the second spring of Arda, and the Eldar increased, and beneath the new sun Beleriand grew green and fair. At the first rising of the sun, the younger children of Iluvata awoke in the land of Hildorian, in the eastward regions of Middle-earth. But the first sun arose in the west, and the opening eyes of men were turned towards it, and their feet, as they wandered over the earth for the most part, strayed that way. The Atani they were named by the Eldar, the second people. But they called them also Hildor, the followers and many other names, Apanona, the afterborn, Engwar, the sickly, and Firima, the mortals. And they named them the usurpers, the strangers, and the inscrutable, the self-cursed, the heavy-handed, the night-fearers, the children of the sun. Of men little is told in these tales which concern the eldest days before the waxing of mortals, and the waning of the elves, save of those fathers of men, the Atanatari, who in the first years of the sun and moon wandered into the north of the world. To Hildorian there came no valour to guide men, or to summon them to dwell in Valinor. And men have feared the valour rather than loved them, and have not understood the purposes of the powers, being at variance with them, and at strife with the world. Ulmo nonetheless took thought for them, aiding the counsel and will of Manwe, and his messages came often to them by stream and flood. But they have not skill in such matters, and still less had they in those days before they had mingled with the elves. Therefore they loved the waters, and their hearts were stirred. But they understood not the messages." Yet it is told that ere long they met dark elves in many places, and were befriended by them. And men became the companions and disciples in their childhood of these ancient folk, 
wanderers of the elven race, who never set out upon the paths to Valinor, and knew of the Valar only as a rumour and a distant name. Morgoth had then not long come back into Middle-earth, and his power went not far abroad, and was, moreover, checked by the sudden coming of great light. There was little peril in the lands and hills, and there were new things devised long ages before in the thought of Yavanna, and sown a seed in the dark, came at last to their budding and their bloom. West, north, and south, the children of men spread and wandered, and their joy was the joy of the morning before the dew is dry, when every leaf is green. But the dawn is brief, and the day full often belies its promise. And now the time drew on to the great wars of the powers of the north, when Noldor and Sindar and men strove against the hosts of Morgoth Bauglir, and went down in ruin. To this end, the cunning lies of Morgoth that he sowed of old, and sowed ever anew among his foes, and the curse that came of the slaying at Alqualande, and the oath of Feanor, were ever at work. Only a part is here told of the deeds of those days, and most is said of the Noldor and the Silmarils, and the mortals that became entangled in their fate. In those days elves and men were of like stature and strength of body, but the elves had greater wisdom and skill and beauty, and those who had dwelt in Valinor and looked upon the powers as much surpassed the dark elves in these things as they in turn surpassed the people of mortal race. Only in the realm of Doriath, whose queen Melian was of the kindred of Valar, did the Sindar come near to match the Calaquendi of the blessed realm. Immortal were the elves, and their wisdom waxed from age to age, and no sickness nor pestilence brought death to them. Their bodies, indeed, were of the stuff of earth, and could be destroyed. And in those days they were more like to the bodies of men, since they had not so long been inhabited by the fire of their spirit, which consumes them from within in the courses of time. But men were more frail, more easily slain by weapon or mischance, and less easily healed subject to sickness and many ills, and they grew old and died. What may befall their spirits after death, the elves know not. Some say that they too go to the halls of Mandos. But their place of waiting there is not that of the elves, and Mandos, under Ilovata alone, save Manwe, knows whither they go after the time of recollection in those silent halls beside the outer sea. None have ever come back from the mansions of the dead, save only Beren, son of Barahir, whose hand had touched a Silmaril. But he never spoke afterwards to mortal men. The fate of men after death, maybe, is not in the hands of the Valar, nor was all foretold in the music of the Ainur. In after days, when because of the triumph of Morgoth, elves and men became estranged, as he most wished, those of the elven race that lived still in Middle-earth waned and faded, and men usurped the sunlight. Then the Quendi wandered in the lonely places of the great lands and the isles, and took to the moonlight and the starlight and to the woods and caves, becoming as shadows and memories, save those who ever and anon set sail into the west and vanished from Middle-earth. But in the dawn of years, elves and men were allies, and held themselves akin, and there were some among men that learned the wisdom of the Eldar, and became great and valiant among the captains of the Noldor. And in the glory and beauty of the elves, and in their fate, full share had the offspring of elf and mortal, Eärendil, and Elwing, and Elrond their child. Thank you.